Dit is donderdag 28 maart, ons is hier in Nelspreid en ons het gestrand een goeie funksie gehad vir Suidland burgerlijke beskerming daar in Witrevier, so dankie vir die van julle wat het bijgewoon het. En ek doe nou vandag twee opnames, een vir vandag en een vir morgen, wat op die goeie vrijdag is, dan kan ek vir jou uh, morgen ook een opzet, maar dan hoef ek nie te sit en dit morgen dier die loop van die dag te doen nie, terwyl ons met die familie keier. Goed, ons gaan aan met The Long Lost Grave. Wolstein couldn't sleep. The night was hot and he was restless. He thought about the diving, wondering about the gold. The continuous absence of the coins worried him. They should at least have found some of it by now. True, there were other coins, but none of them were gold. Mostly silver, belonging to the sailor, sailors and soldiers. There was almost nothing left of the wreck itself, and that was exactly what caused his worry. The coins should have strewn about in the same disorder as the rest of the wreckage. All the time at various positions below, they found the same things. Musket balls, rusty swords and brass buttons, but not a trace of the gold. Not even one single coin. He sighed, turned on his back and reached for his cigarettes. The wreck was extremely rich with brass, copper and lead, he thought as he sucked the smoke deep into his lungs. They were by no means wasting their time, but brass and copper and antiques seemed to so dull and insignificant in comparison to the gold, but maybe the next day or the day thereafter. Had de Boer found anything down there? No, unlikely. They had been here too short to have removed it all. Even if they had found a few coins, there should still be many more around. Yet nothing. He thought about the fate of their fishing boat. A curious matter and even more shocking when he had learned about the old man's tragic death. At that stage, he had to admit he again had doubts about the accident, until yesterday. It was soon after they had gone down there when he came upon the transparent bottle amongst the seaweed and kelp. He could see the label clearly, black and white scotch whisky. He immediately remembered Tony and Louis' casual specula speculations about the old man being drunk at the time of the accident. Therefore, it was a significant piece of evidence, and he had brought it aboard. Encouraged by Tony, he immediately radioed the police on the citizens' band. After some frustrating waiting, he had finally managed to speak to Sergeant Fisaghi, who was more than just curious about the bottle, especially as it was a whiskey bottle. Within half an hour, a police patrol boat arrived to fetch it. The sergeant himself was present. He had asked about an anchor, but they could only shake their heads. Anchor? What anchor? He had thought quietly. No. And that was it. Proof of the rumours and peace for his mind. It indeed looked as if the old man had had an accident while under the influence of whisky. He stubbed out his cigarette and swung his feet to the deck. He was thirsty. Perhaps an ice-cold Coca-Cola would help. And, without waiting, he went out and up the ladder that led to the saloon. He stopped dead in the doorway. The door of the refrigerator was open, its tiny interior light burning and silhouetted in front of it was Selina. In the dim light, she was bent forward, her hands examining the contents. Her face was hidden by unruly hair that curtained forward over her shoulders, and Will could see her breasts in the t-shirt. Her long legs were bare, and the light gleamed on the glossy material of her jogger. He stood captivated, the sight of her body too much as desire coursed through him. He was unaware, or she was unaware of his presence, and unconsciously tucked at the elastic of her pants. It was enough, and he stepped forward, placing his hands on her shoulders. She stiffened with a gasp. It's me, 
he whispered. She glanced at him in surprise, stared for a moment, and then her expression slowly changed to one of delight. I came for a coke, he panted, and she smiled, her teeth white in the dim light. Me too, she replied softly and turned back to the, fri to the refrigerator, stooping forward again. The thin material of her jogger stretched over her rounded buttocks and wool moved forward against her. She didn't resist as he closed his arms around her, but straightened slowly and turned in his arms. She faced him with a confused and worried expression. Oh, Will, she whispered softly as she slowly closed her arms around his neck. I love you, she muttered in her hair and hugged her. He muttered in her hair and hugged her to him. What are we going to do? But neither of them knew the answer to that. Both were thinking about the same thing. There could never be anything more than a secret affair between them. Not as long as Ashley Gordon Forbes was there. And right now they were both very much involved with him. There was no easy way out. Not now. Not yet. How long they had stood like that, he didn't know. But Will suddenly became aware of the distant shore and rocks through the window opposite them. Even in the little starlight, he could see the huge plumes of white spray as the waves broke on the rocks. Awfully close. He started. Why, the shore was on the wrong side of the boat too. He swung around and back staring stunned through the saloon windows. Good heavens, they were drifting. Selina, he said urgently, something is wrong. I better take a look. What is it? she asked, alarmed. We are adrift. Come, let's take a look. There was no doubt that they were drifting towards the shore. Will could instantly see the change in the relation to the coast and they hurried to the bow. He grabbed the anchor rope and heaved. He nearly lost his balance and stared stupefied at the six feet of rope in his hands. Cut, he blurted. We were cut loose. Bastards! And he ran for the open bridge. Going up the ladder two steps at a time, he called back to her. Call the others, quickly! They were close to the shore and drifting fast with the current and sea breeze. Will could already feel the increasing force of the waves and he fumbled with the keys. Eyes reverted on the tachometer and he turned the key of the starboard engine. He tried twice before the trustworthy Mercruiser came alive and he grunted with relief as the second engine fired first time. At that moment, the wrecker sharply keeled over and he heard Selina scream somewhere below. He spun the wheel towards the open sea and pushed both throttles forward. The twin propellers bit in the water with unrelenting force and the cruiser lurched forward. The wrecker forcefully climbed the huge swell and burst through the speckled crest with a jarring jolt and sent spray all over her. For a brief moment, the propellers uh, cavitated as she crossed the crest. Then she was racing for the safety of the open sea. One last swell ahead the rigger cleaved it nice and easy. The relief was indescribable. Sweat streamed down his face and he laughed crazily above the reassured whine of the mercruiser. Then he started shaking. Will Stein's heart was thumping wildly in his chest. It was close, too close. A mile out to sea, he eased the throttles back. He laughed half hysterically as the pale and bewildered faces of first Tony, then Louis, and lastly Selina appeared above the ladder. Good gracious, what happened? Will slumped back against the controls, breathing hard, but once again in full control. We were cut loose, he answered hoarsely. Another two minutes and we would have been on the rocks. Appalled, they stared at him. 
So they struck back, Tony mused. Will nodded gravely. In a way, yes, but this isn't fair play. Tony knew better, yet he said nothing. Prepare the standby anchor, Will ordered quietly and watched the two men leaving. As soon as they were gone, Selina crossed to him, smuggling up against him. He held her within the circle of his arms as he watched Tony and Louis working at the bow. If it wasn't for your thirst and our love, he paused, then we would have made it. It's a sign, she muttered feverishly. It's a sign. We belong together. We are meant for each other. And he couldn't agree more. Neither did he want to. And he kissed her hair. Go below, he said. I will be along as soon as we've anchored again. I will wait for you. And he knew she would. The cork came off with a satisfying plonk. Rob grunted with satisfaction as he smiled as he smelled the sweet aroma of the wine. Excellent, he exclaimed and reached for the tin of smoked oysters. He smacked his lips in anticipation as he dumped the, the brown delicacies on the plate. Then, whistling gaily, bottle and glass in one hand, the oysters in the other, he strolled into Kathy's bedroom. With his shoes off, Pillows popped behind his back, and with a glass of superb KWV pinotage in his hand, he reclined lazily on the bed. On his lap rested the thick logbook of the HMS Liberty. Sipping the tasty wine, he stared at the frail, at the frail cover and age-yellowed pages. Somewhere in this book, a secret was hidden. A secret that would lead him to answers, and eventually, to where? To the goal, perhaps, hopefully, if he could only find those missing pages. He opened the book and started reading, pausing only to refill his glass or to light a cigarette. He took care to read it carefully. Absorbing the facts, he tried to visualize the situation as the story unfolded trying to live himself into Martin's position. He left nothing out, re-read passages whenever he was uncertain and meticulously made notes of anything that might be of significance. He was certain of one thing. Captain Martin's had left a key to the secret... Um, Captain Martin's had left a key to the secret if the gold had indeed been taken off before the Liberty had sunk. Three quarters through the bottle, he well into his second tin of oysters, the outside door burst open. Moments later, Cathy walked into the room, dumped her rucksack in the corner, wiped at a rebellious strand of hair as she returned, and she saw him. For a surprised moment, she stared amazed, and then her whole face broke into a joyous smile. She bounced on the bed with a gleeful giggle, startled him, and sat back with a broad smile, happily watching as he coughed on the wine. Rob stared at her. He didn't expect her back yet, and he chuckled. Hi, Ranger, he growled. Glad you are back from the forest. How's my girl? She was in his arms, her lips pressed against his, her hair wildly hiding their faces. Oh, my wonderful man, she muttered between the kisses. I nearly died of loneliness. Rob laughed and squirmed as she nuzzled his face and neck feverishly. It tickles, he objects weakly and grabbed the back of her head and pulled her face into his neck. That's better, he grumbled, and she set his neck with a ferocious growl. He quickly realized. He quickly released her. With laughing eyes, she stared into his four, into his four inches away. Or into him four inches away. I love you, she simmered and kissed the tip of his nose. Now tell me, did you miss me too? 
Terribly, he nodded feebly. Truly, I had an awful time. He reached for his glass and took a sip. A little for me? She innocently held her mouth forward and he offered the glass. No, no, not like that. Like a big bird would feed her chick. And I am your chick, right? Rob chuckled and obli obliged. Ah, she sighed contently. That's better. Rob had to agree. It was, wasn't bad at all. But when she kissed him again, there was a serious determination in her eyes and she was moving suggestively on his lap. Woman, he growled as he put the glass down. Seven o'clock Sunday morning, Rob de Boer eased himself into a sitting position. He yawned lazily, stretching his arms above his head and reached for a camel filter. Next to him, Kathy stirred sleepily, turned over and carelessly flung her arm across his stomach, her head sideways against his chest. Inhaling the first cigarette of the day, one hand absently caressing Kathy's bare shoulders. He stared contently through the wide open window to the grey morning sky. He sighed happily, blowing the smoke upwards so that it wouldn't disturb her. Through the window he could hear the roar of the sea, the squawking of the seabirds, and in his heart was a peaceful tranquility he had seldom experienced. It was going to be a beautiful day. He glanced fondly at the sleeping woman. Of course, she was absolutely furious when she had learned about the escapade with the wrecker. With flaming eyes, she snapped. Now you are no better than they are. She stubbornly refused to exchange one civil word with him for a whole agonizing hour. Looking greatly disappointed, she approached him with a cup of coffee. We must do... We must do such silly things. Stop feeling guilty about yours. Her lips trembled. Leave it to the police now. I am sure they know what to do. And, of course, he was ashamed of what he had done and told her so. Fortunately, no harm had come to the wrecker and its crew. And now, as he savoured the last draws from the cigarette, her eyes fluttered open. Momentarily confused, she stared at him, then her face relaxed into a loving smile, and she stretched out lusciously. She briefly lay like that, listening to the sound of the pounding breakers. Isn't this wonderful? Great, especially with you in my arms. She smiled happily. What's the time? she asked and grabbed his wrist, turning his watch towards her. Oh, goodness, 7.30, and she scrambled up. Hey, what's the haste? We are going to church. To church? He was amazed. She smiled sweetly. Of course, if you want to be with me, then you must come to church with me. But I don't have a suit here. That, my dear, is the least of your problems. And she bounced off the bed and crossed to her closet. He watched her rummaging through her dresses and turned back to him with a victorious grin. She held up a neat-looking grey suit. His eyes narrowed suspiciously. And whose is that? Kathy convulsed with laughter. laughter. Don't look so upset, she panted. It belongs to my father. He left it behind after their last visit. Your father? But I didn't know you still have a father. Of course I still do. And a mother. And where do you think I came from? <laughs> she chuckled at the perplexed expression on his face. As a matter of fact, I have a little sister too. Surprised? He shook his head wryly. I am damned. I guess the two of us should start to get to know each other. But in his own way, he was delighted to learn about her family. Except for Herbie, he had never known much of a family himself. He grinned. I just never thought of family, but it's great. You think your dad is my size? It will suit you fine. 
She came across and sat down beside him. The grey suit folded, folded on her lap. I have wonderful parents, Rob, and a cute little sister. I will take you to meet them. That's it, if you want to. That is, if you want to. I would like that. And she hugged him with delight. The borrowed suit fitted him like a glove. Perhaps a little narrow across the shoulders, but well enough to wear. And with Cathy sitting beside him, primly dressed in her white dress, Rob drove the BMW past the tent camp, honked twice and sped towards the gate. Old Raphael opened it with a wide, toothless grin, shaking his head as the car drove through. It started to look as if the uh, missus finally found her man. In his wise old mind, he quietly approved of her choice. Hadn't Gabby Wilson told him about the heroic fight in Pittenberg Bay? And he had always uh, respected men who stood firm in their principles and who would fight for what they believed was right, despite the odds. Yeah, he thought as he crossed to the opposite lane where cars were waiting to enter. The man might just be able to control the ranger, for that was one woman who needed a real strong and firm man. Rob stole a few glances at Kathy. He had never seen her like this before. Wearing a dress, nylon stockings, proper makeup and a suitable hat, she appeared vastly different from the khaki pants boot wearer he had come to know, but no less appealing. Quite the contrary. She was all feminine and attractive, and his heart squeezed with his love when she smiled at him and spontaneously placed a hand on his thigh as he drove. With discernible pride, Rob led her down the aisle between the rows of pews in the Dutch Reformed Church. At an empty pew, he stopped and stood aside to allow her to enter first. Smiling at him, she slid past with him close next to her. He strutted awkwardly, tucked almost nervously at the collar of his shirt, and guiltily wondered when was the last time that he had seen the inside of a church. Cathy, sensing his obvious discomfort, took his hand and smiled reassuringly. The church was full. Rob curiously watched the people and noticed Klaus Weber in the opposite wing, with a small, frail girl next to him, and he involuntarily touched his own face, feeling the still-coloured bruises with mild satisfaction. Klaus's face looked twice as bad, with eyes hidden behind dark glasses. His mouth was a thin, mean-looking line and Rob couldn't tell whether the man was looking at him or not. But he nonetheless lifted one finger slightly above his shoulder in a taunting salute. With a sharp, intolerant hiss, Cathy snapped his hand down, her eyes spitting fire at his mischief. Don't! Her lips pouted warningly. But he was greatly tempted to repeat his greeting when, he, when the impeccably dressed Lieutenant Murray slipped into a pew not far from Klaus. Only Cathy's scolding eyes prevented him, although he did incline his head. From under her hat, Cathy saw the Lieutenant's girl stiffen and she pinched Rob's arm, but at the same time couldn't help feeling the twinge of pleasure at the discomfort of the haughty lady beside and equally uneasy and flustered chief of police. Everybody knew about the illustrious fight and there were many furtive smirks and smiles, but no one dared doing it openly. Out of fear for Klaus's well-known anger, but his reputation had suffered badly and many of his female admirers craned their necks to get a better view of the victor, silently wishing they could exchange places with a faintly smiling Cathy, who was all but oblivious to the admiring glances. 
Klaus II was more than aware of those envious gazes, and his humiliation was crushing. For years he had reigned as king here, the Casanova about town and unbeaten in any fight. Rob de Boer had crushed his image and self-respect behind revi beyond revival. Klaus hated him, and he hated Cathy for there was for she was for all to see, sitting snug next to his enemy. But his day would come, and his revenge would be sweet. In the end, he would have the last laugh. In his mind's eye, he could already see the vast improvements and expansions that his, stare of, that his share of the gold would bring. His future plans to broaden his services to enlarge his garage and sport shops would finally come true. And in a way, that would compensate for the humiliation he was now experiencing. With his wealth doubled, no, tripled, his influence and power would soar and he would be well, well away forever. Yeah, he thought grimly, in the end, losing Cathy would be worthwhile. But to ensure that, he had to ascertain that the gold was found as planned, hopefully without interference from the Boer. If the preacher could have known the thoughts of some of his congregation, his devotion would have been rocked to its foundations. But fortunately, he was unaware of these dark and vengeful thoughts behind the passive faces. Despite Rob's efforts and Cathy's proding, his eyes kept blinking sleepily. But somehow, somewhere, through the sermon, his mind clicked with something the preacher had said. It was about yours. God's ways are a mystery to man. He gives and he takes, and we cannot understand. But it all plays a part in God's greater plan, and... So it came that he took Jos Visaghi away. Jos was a good man, in his own way, and we can only pray that his soul may rest in peace. He loved the sea. He lived and worked with the sea, and his grave is the sea. Rob didn't listen further, nor did he notice the quick smirk that came over Klaus's face. He thought of Jos and his watery grave. How could he rest in peace when he was murdered and lying in such a grave? But then, once dead, did it really make any difference where one rested? Take Captain Martins's grave in the cave. Grave? And his eyes flew wide open as he stared abruptly, a sudden idea clarifying itself in his mind. The cave is Martinson's grave. He recalled it with a startling clarity from the logbook. Martins wrote, I am the only one alive who knows the truth and I am burying it here with me in my grave. The truth, the answer to the mystery, the missing pages, burying it with him, the truth. I'll be resting in peace on my grave, not in his grave, but on it, buried with him. But he wasn't buried. The rest, he rest on his grave. It hit him with a force that stunned him. The answer, the key to the secret. And his breath quickened with excitement. The missing pages that hold the answer were buried in the cave. And then everything seemed so clear that he was amazed at his own blindness. There was no gold on the wreck. Herbie had been right. If it comes to the worst, we must try to save it. The gold must not be lost. The gold was indeed taken ashore before he had gone down, and that had to be when the crew learned about it. But I am the only one alive who knows the truth. Those ill-fated last days were perhaps the present whereabouts of the gold. I am burying it in my grave, resting on my grave. Absolutely, that must be it. His heart beat in his throat and he trembled slightly. Cathy stared suspiciously at him. Gone was his drowsiness, 
Instead, she saw an almost impatient anxiety as he leaned forward, and the hand she was clutching was suddenly damp, damp in hers. It felt like an eternity before the sermon finally came to an end, and the congregation surged out through the wooden doors. What's the matter? Cathy asked the moment they stepped outside. I've got it, he said excitedly. Cathy, girl, I have it. She stared at him in confusion. Got what? What are you talking about? The gold, he exclaimed. I know where it is. Stunned, she stared at him, saw that he was serious. Just as she opened her mouth to reply, somebody stepped up to them, interrupting their gazes. It was Sergeant Fisaghi, and his expression was grim. Rob, I must talk to you. Sure, Mike, what's up? Rob replied, perplexed. <clears throat> Let's move a little aside, and he quickly led them away. Rob, it's official. Yours died in an accident. Rob gaped at the sergeant. How come? They found the bottle of uh, the whiskey bottle, and there is no trace of an anchor. The story that now sticks is that Uncle Yos wasted anchor after drinking too much and in the process misjudged the sea and wrecked his boat. It's absurd. Fisaghi shook his head gravely. No, I've seen the bottle myself. In fact, I went to fetch it. An empty bottle of black and white scotch whiskey and no trace of the anchor. Black and white? Cathy gasped glancing sideways at Rob. Why, yes, the label was still there. Mike Fisaghi's voice trailed off as he watched their stunned faces, a glint of suspicion in his eyes. Uh, Mike, Rob stuttered and cleared his throat. I guess there is something more that you should know. Kathy nodded vigorously, and Fisaghi looked puzzled. You see... Rob started guiltily. We sent a full bottle of whiskey to yours that evening. He asked for it. The sergeant's face clouded. But Rob held up a hand. Wait, let me finish. The fact is that it was not black and white. It was white horse. It was Mike's Fisaghi's turn to be astounded. And what is more, Cathy continued fervently, she found the, we found the bottle still half full the next day. The policeman stared at them, eyes flashing from the one to the other. Are you sure about this? His voice was harsh. Where is it now? Rob nodded. There is no doubt, Mike. We found the same bottle we had given him. And with brief detail, he recounted everything. Fisaghi grunted. What are the chances of any other bottles aboard? No chance, Rob shook his head. We took all the rubbish ashore with us. Also the bottle we had finished after the shark and at after the shark attack and that one was also white horse. Why didn't you tell us all of this before? Rob shrugged. It's obvious, Mike, to prevent this whole cock and bull story of inebration, but now with this planted evidence, it's another ball game. Now I'm almost sorry we didn't keep it. But Mike Fisaghi was no longer disgruntled. What you've just told me hold both great and grave significance. One, now we know for certain that it was murder and that someone is trying to cover it up. Two, someone, maybe all, on the cabin cruiser is is or are involved. It gives us some very definite directions. Three, you two are to testify about the bottle. He paused seriously. But, and it's a very important one, no one, and I mean no one, is to know about this or the second bottle, all right? He nodded. Meanwhile, I'm going to make some inquiries of my own. Something about this whole thing is fishy, and I intend to find out what. But, Rob, keep in touch and let me know about your thing, okay? You can bet on it, he replied solemnly, as soon as I learn more. 
and watch your back, the sergeant warned sincerely before sauntering away to where his wife stood waiting. Cathy slowly turned to Rob, lifted her hands to her lip, hips and gazed at him. She lifted her hands to her hips and gazed at him, levelly from under her hat. Now, Rob de Boer, she demanded, tell me why you almost upset the whole congregation, how you came to know the whereabouts of the gold, and lastly, her eyes held an adamant glint, how come you and Sergeant Fisaghi know each other so well? Good questions, he grinned, typically feminine curiosity. But come, let's start back. Maybe I will tell you as we drive. She gasped indignantly. Feminine curiosity? I... Come quickly, we have a lot of packing to do. Robert de Boer. But she followed hastily, clutching her hat. Geniet die rest van jou aand en ook jou paasnaweek.